Good afternoon, everyone. How are you today? Welcome uh, to the Bataan Foundation, and hopefully you're enjoying this wonderful, wonderful weather we're having. Um, you know in Atlanta, things can change in a minute, so <laughs> we should be enjoying weather like today. My name is Anthony Knight, and I'm the founder and president of the Bataan Foundation. And it's really a pleasure for us to welcome two really important individuals here uh, for this conversation about faith and struggle in the lives of four African Americans. Um, Dr. Randall Jelks, who wrote the book, and then we're really honored to have with us Dr. Tiari Jones, whom many of you may know, uh, wrote the most, her most recent book, An American Marriage, and teaches over at Emory. So it's really an honor for us to have them both with us. Uh, before I do their introductions, I'd just like to remind you if you could please turn off your cell phones so that we're not distracted. Um, Doctors Jones and Jelks will have a conversation that lasts maybe 25 minutes or so, after which we'll open the floor up for uh, questions for, for them. And then we have a number of their books available outside. So if you'd like to purchase a book, we'd love for you to do that. The independent bookseller with whom we work is Acapella Books, and they're always happy to donate a portion of the proceeds um, back to the Bataan Foundation, so uh, that certainly helps us out. Uh, the library also wanted me to remind you that today's program is being recorded, but they're also live streaming it on Facebook. So I'm not the technology geek, but for those of you who love Twitter and um, Facebook and other modes of social media that you can share with friends that you might know who can't be here today, but would like to hear the conversation, they are live streaming it on Facebook. So I wanted to let you know that as well. So I have a real brief bio for Dr. Jones, and then we'll have her come out, and then Dr. Jelks, and we will get the conversation started. Uh, Tiari Jones is the author of four novels, including An American Marriage, Silver Sparrow, the Untelling and Leaving Atlanta. Jones holds degrees from Spelman College, Arizona State University, and the University of Iowa. A winner of numerous literary awards, she is a professor of creative writing at Emory University. And she will be in conversation with Dr. Jelks. Uh, Randall Jelks is professor of African, of African and African American Studies and American Studies. He holds courtesy appointments in history, religious studies, and is the co-editor of the journal American Studies. Jelks is a graduate of the University of Michigan, McCormick Theological Seminary, and Michigan State University, University from which he obtained his PhD in comparative black histories. Jelks is also a clergy person in the Presbyterian Church. He is the author of two award-winning books, African Americans in the Furniture City, The Struggle for Civil Rights, um, Struggle in Grand Rapids, which was published in 2006. I'm sorry, 2006, and was awarded in 2006, the State History Award. Uh, a biographer, uh, and he also wrote uh, Benjamin Elijah Mays, Schoolmaster of the Movement, a biography. Uh, his latest book is titled Faith and Struggle in the Lives of Four African Americans. And he currently is writing a book entitled My Friends Call Me Benny, the Benjamin May story for young readers. In addition, serving as the executive producer of a two-part biological biographical documentary, I Too Sing America, Langston Hughes' Unfurled. Jelks has been a fellow at the National Humanities Center in Research Triangle, North Carolina, and has held a Fulbright Distinguished Chair in American Studies um, at Mer I'm sorry, Masaryk University in the Czech Republic, uh, and has taught at the University of Ghana, the Institute for African American Studies. It gives me great pleasure to welcome both Dr. Jelks and Dr. Jones to the stage. Let's give them a warm welcome. First, we'd like to thank you all for coming. It is always just a gift for people to come together, particularly on such a beautiful day. Yes. Is your mic on? Yes. Okay. It is. 
Well, I have to say, congratulations on this book. It's quite an achievement. And after reading this book, I feel like I should start calling you Reverend Jokes, Reverend Dr. Jokes. Oh, uh, some days. <laughs> it's a Sunday, so we'll do it today. <laughs> I noticed that you start this, at the start of this book, an introduction, you declare yourself to be a believer. And I noticed that you use the term believer and not a Christian, but you say a believer. But also, why did you feel the need to start the book with, you call it a confession, but it doesn't really feel like a confession to me. It sounds like a declaration. Uh, I, this is the first time I've had that question, but I, I call myself a believer because uh, the opening lines is from really uh, Margaret Walker's poem, uh, We Have Been Believers. Uh, and you know, it, uh, it's like, and it's one of those beautiful uh, poems, like you can chant it, We Have Been Believers, and, and uh, uh, God, and, and angry gods, and unknown gods, and, and so forth. So I found that a line in, intriguing. Uh, she, at the end of that poem, uh, uh, critiques a sort of black faith. And I uh, wanted to say, well, there is something positive about uh, being a believer. Uh, not to deny that I grew up uh, in a Christian home with uh, Christian customs and, and other things. So uh, that term really came from me thinking about uh, uh, Margaret Walker, and, and also thinking about that, that uh, in, in um, the area of history and in black studies, uh, African American studies, uh, people feel very hesitant about uh, faith, uh, to talk about it, even though black people uh, talk about faith all the time, uh, theology, they debate theologies, beauty shop, barber shop, I was at the barber shop a week and a half ago and people were debating some kind of theological premise and so I thought it was important to talk about what real black folks believe in and so forth. Yeah. You know, but it seems to me that a lot of times, particularly in American culture, if you say you're a person of faith or you say you're a believer, people assume you mean Christianity. Uh, absolutely, um, you know, the um, United States was shaped by uh, the, the kind of European Reformation, the Protestantism that came to the United States uh, is the dominant narrative, even though you could tell the narrative of the United States from its Catholic side, from uh, Louisiana or Florida, or any a number of things. And so there's always been a, a discussion in American culture about particularly uh, Protestant faith. But it seems that this book, at least the way I understand it though, is not so much about the four people you profile and their relationship to Christianity in a narrow sense? No, it's, it's uh, what I call the uh, black Protestantism. You know, you know um, African people uh, were unified in a, in a, in a strange sense by, by creating their own Protestant institutions. Um, they, they gave them language and culture, a unifying kind of principle. Uh, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois called the AME Church the greatest institution that black people created in the 19th century because it was, it was sort of a forming a communal base around religion of a diversity of people. Uh, so uh, even if you decided that you didn't want to be Christian, uh, say in the case of Muhammad Ali, you're still fighting with the kind of dominant principles and narrative that uh, American culture, and particularly black culture gives to us. And one of the things that I found really um, inspiring and interesting about the book is the how much wiggle room there was to think about, to think about faith. I think a lot of times we think about faith and religion and we think about a set of kind of rigid doctrines. You do this, you can't do that, and a way of control. But it seems like, and you talk in this book, the people find a freedom in their faith. Yeah, they find the freedom to live uh, all kinds of ways. But that's uh, the thing that I grew up with, you know, uh, Tiari. I grew up in New Orleans, and I think that uh, I was an observer that people, uh, my grandmother was a devout Baptist. Uh, she was baptized in uh, 1918 in the Mississippi River by Reverend Sweet, have the whole story. But when her arthritis got to the best of her, she went to see the root lady. Uh, down the street, 
you know, and she said, well, you know, Reverend Johnson, her pastor, he can preach up a storm, but he can't do nothing about my knee. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was always like, oh, well, well how, how does that work, you know? <laughs> Okay, so you find the root lady fixing her knee as a spiritual thing. Well, she, it was, because the root lady claimed to be spiritual, right? I thought like when you asked the, the root lady to fix your marriage, I thought that was <laughs> well, when it did, got she spiritual. She did knees and marriages, too. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you need both. That's right, right, right. Can you talk to us a little bit about how you, why and how you chose to speak about each one of the people profiled in this book? Well, it really started out with the first person, Ethel Waters, uh, um, uh, the writer and cultural critic then for the New York Times, Margo Jefferson, wrote an article, just a, a paragraph article, it was about each writer had to write a paragraph about a, a, a woman who, um, that they admired, uh, that, the, that they thought was shocking. And I, again, grew up in the South in the 60s, and my grandmother uh, believed in religious TV. Uh, and religious TV meant, in, in my era, two television shows, uh, Billy Graham and Bishop Fulton Sheen. Uh, and Bishop Sheen, and I would, say, I would say to my grandmother, Granny, you're not Catholic. Why are we watching Bishop Sheen? She said, this is good for you. You know, uh, anything that was religious had to be good, good moral values. And then Billy Graham, and I saw Ethel Waters on television um, and I thought she, I, I was forming consciousness of them about the 60s, and I thought, oh, this woman looks like uh, Aunt Jemima, uh, you know, and I, um, and so, I, you know, I didn't give it any more thought, so I read Margot's paragraphs, and her paragraph goes, opens up, Ethel Waters was a notorious lesbian, and my head, because I went back to my childhood, went, and so I said, well, did the, the Graham crusade know this? Did the, you know, I, I th started thinking about that, and that article generated. So I started saying, okay, I, I'm the historian. I'm, I'm going to go to the archives. So I want to know what the Graham crusade said to Ethel Waters, what Ethel Waters said about the Graham crusade. And then um, uh, two subsequent biographies came out on it, but I didn't think they dealt with what she said about her life. That, that, that God had always been in her life uh, and that she found a freedom in our life. Uh, and, and so I wanted to put those two things together. Okay, Mary Lou Williams. Mary Lou Williams is because I just heard her when I was a college student in a record store. And um, I grew up in the era when uh, jazz meant black masculinity. And I heard this pianist and I was like in the record store who is this woman, and uh, who is this pianist? And the guy said, Mary Lou Williams. And I was like, Mary Lou who? Uh, and I sort of bought a couple of records uh, for, uh, by her and to hear her play. And as I was thinking about, she and Ethel were roughly contemporary. So Ethel was a little older in her, 1896, she, Ethel was born. And Mary Lou was born in 1910. But I was out in the middle of the country, can and I'm by Kansas City, and she she played in Kansas City with the Andy Kirk Orchestra, and and then moved on in uh, to back to New York, and so I was interested again because in the 50s she stopped playing when she had a Catholic conversion, and I wanted to know uh, uh, more about that and why what she was thinking, again trying to treat the kind of her faith perspective, the other writers, uh, uh, two uh, biographies of Mary Lou, uh, and I wanted to try to treat her, what I think her inner journey was toward that. I'm curious, so why did she stop playing when she had a Catholic conversion? Well, she really took seriously, um, she was almost, uh, I, I think she wanted to live the monastic life for a moment, like, to give away all of her things to, and she started a foundation and tried to get all the musicians who were strung out on heroin in. And so she was uh, and trying to get the great piano player, Bud Powell, uh, he suffered mental illness uh, help. And so she was just trying to be St. Mary, uh, St. Mary Lou. Okay, now, Eldridge Cleaver. Let's talk about him. <laughs> That's a complicated brother. 
Oh, Eldridge is, uh, when I went to visit both Berkeley and um, Texas A&M where his papers are, I always felt like I needed a stiff drink afterwards. Uh, because Eldridge, it, it was defied convention. But what was striking to me was I was rereading Soul on Ice. And Soul on Ice came out in uh, 1968, 60, uh, and sold two million copies and, at the time. And, um, and, I, and it was a part of this kind of prison literature that was being uh, published. And I was struck by, when I reread re Soul on Ice, how much he's talking about religion. Now, everybody here may not know about Soul on Ice, so yeah. why don't you just give a little backstory well, on that? Well, uh, some of you all, Eldridge Cleaver was a, a, in prison. Uh, uh, he went to prison early on, about 15 years old, for selling uh, marijuana, uh, weed. And in those days, they gave, you, uh, they gave you time. So he started off uh, uh, in jail, and then he became this uh, a very abusive a uh, person, uh, he began to rape women, and he started practicing ma raping black women first. And he, he says this all uh, clearly until then he was gonna rape white, white women. And um, uh, in, in jail, he encountered uh, um, uh, Malcolm X, the, uh, many people in jail in the 1960s, and he became a part of the Nation of Islam and tried to uh, reform his life uh, and to, to deal with his life and his, his uh, horrifying past. Um, and, um, and, and he got out of prison and he, started, he, and he got this book published, uh, Soul on Ice. And uh, it, it was read by everybody uh, in the late 60s, early 70s. Okay, and then? And then, what they, he and Kathleen uh, Cleaver uh, becomes, uh, and they become the Black Power uh, couple. You know, they're like the Jay Z and Beyonce. A couple. Black Power. A Black Power. No, look at the photographs. You always see them. She got the big fro. You know, Eldridge is is tall, and and he runs for president. Uh, he's celebrity. Uh, you know, he's in San Francisco. Um, and uh, he's, uh, and then they get exiled because of uh, the 1960s and the shooting uh, that got a youngster named Bobby Hutton killed. They were all uh, participating in that, and they go on exile first in Cuba, uh, then to uh, uh, Algeria, uh, and then it, then in France. Uh, uh, Kathleen comes back, and she is she still your colleague at Emory? Is she was teaching at the law school. I've only been teaching at Emory a couple of weeks. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who's there well, yet. Yeah, I look for her. She teaches law here in Atlanta. So, okay, so then they go into exile. Then things get really weird. Yeah, well, just walk well, it all the way down. Yeah, just, just, yeah, come on. They're all, they're all the way weird. They've never, wasn't weird, because I always, you know, I thought, well, that was an interesting choice. Didn't fun. he end up hanging out, not with Billy, was it Billy Graham? Oh, he hung out with all of the top evangelicals. Uh, he comes back. Bayard Rustin helps him get back in the country, and he comes back and he has a, a evangelical conversion, and he writes another memoir called Soul on Fire, which is as interesting as Soul on Ice, uh, because almost um, two thirds of it is not about religion; it's about his uh, life in the Panthers. And then he has this conversion story where he says, oh, "Look, I saw, I saw in the uh, Mao, I saw." Marx, uh, and then Jesus came over in, in the moon, in the bloody moon. I was like, man, that's a great narrative, you know. Uh, and he becomes an evangelical. He eventually becomes a Mormon. He, he, uh, he tries to start his own because religion. And then he becomes a Republican. Yeah, he becomes a Republican and a Mormon. And, and, but he's trying that's to. That's a start. lot. Yes. That's, that's a lot. But, but, think, but he's also talking about faith all the time. Fair enough. <laughs> and finally, Muhammad Ali. Well, I'm always, I was interested in Ali because I think people emphasize his draft uh, decision to be resist the war without say, asking the question of why he would resist the war. And he is actually following the path of Elijah Muhammad, uh, who went to jail uh, for um, 
uh, resisting going to World War II. Uh, he went to federal prison uh, and uh, to, I wanted, and even the Supreme Court has trouble uh, with the Ali case because they want to acknowledge freedom of religion, but they don't want to acknowledge that that religion says white people are the devil. And so they rule on a technicality, but they can't rule on the religion because that would affirm uh, that they were, the devil was freeing this black man. <laughs> That's also a lot. <laughs> so you have these four people who live very different lives. What would you say, what conclusions did you draw about, about belief and faith? Well, um, we, we, we tell stories, and you're in there, you, you tell stories too, right? And, but we tell stories about our lives, and we describe our lives using language. Some people describe their lives using faith language, other people describe their lives uh, other ways. And one of the things I, I, wish, uh, I wanted to go is that uh, w we fail to see kind of behind uh, the personal veil. Um, and that's why I use that term opacity. We don't look behind the veil to see the kind of stories that people tell to survive, to, to make it, to overcome. And I think that's a really important thing for um, uh, us, to do, uh, us to do as historians. Uh, you as a novelist, you go deeper into the, your characters' lives. Historians, sometimes we want to tell you grand structures about uh, what's going on and, and not explore the kind of uh, uh, internal lives of the people we're, we're discussing. You use the term, I think, inner truths mm -hmm. to talk about the way that you're looking at them. These, characters, these people are all kind of larger than life. Yeah. How did you go about doing the research to get at what was in their heart? Like what, how did, how did you find that out? Well, I mean, they left a paper trail all of these people, that's, that's the thing being a historian. They left a paper trail. So like there was a wonderful cache of letters of Ethel Waters at the Library of Congress in the music. Uh, and I started it, to her secretary and I started reading them. And uh, you know, I mean sort of like a kind of voyeuristically, I'm in this person's life and about her struggles uh, from weight gain and, and she wants God to help her so she can continue to perform and uh, all of those things. So this, this is the kind of uh, what I felt like it was um, uh, in a core um, uh, to them. Uh, Eth uh, Eldridge Cleaver um, has a first book that never was published about uh, uh, a novel about two men in love in prison uh, living uh, uh, in the same cell, lovers um, and uh, I thought, wow, this is uh, interesting. And he gives the character, one of the characters named Little Jesus. And so it's, it's kind of theological references as, as well. Uh, Ali uh, had dyslexia, so he never, never wrote. But the one letter he did write, um, uh, one of his biographers, Jonathan Eig, uh, shared with me uh, about why he, why he thought the nation was so important to black people's dignity. So I, I, I got a sense of uh, each, of, uh, each of these people and the oral histories that have been done with other people surrounding them. One of the things I found really interesting was this idea how all of these people made an impact on history and they were all fairly public with their faith. And you talk about their inner struggles, but they also were part of institutions, religious institutions that made for social change. And I like, one of the things I like in this book about is the way that faith is talk that the even though they're involved with religious institutions, like the Nation of Islam is a religious institution, you talk a lot about the actual spiritual practices and beliefs that are the reasons why right. the people are in these institutions. And I was thinking about today, what do you see as the role of one spiritual practice in today's movements of liberation? And then what are the roles of the religious institutions today, like what can we learn from this past as we navigate um, the, the challenges we have today? I feel like, I don't know that we can say that we are facing the darkest days today because, you know, I think nothing will ever compare, you know, to slavery, to reconstruction. Nevertheless, it's bad. It's really, really bad out here. 
Well, one of the reasons uh, I think, um, I, I try to say this in the, the book, is that I think uh, we, we have to deal, to, to sustain, you have to have some kind of inner fortitude, put it that way, to face up to the, you know, I mean, each morning you, you look at, uh, on, on my iPad, I look at the one or two, three newspapers, and I go, oh, oh my God, I, how are we going to make it today? You know, I have to have some sense of, and I, I think uh, the institutions, uh, though black churches and other institutions sometimes are kind of shaky, right? And shabbily and run. We're in Atlanta. Yes. yes. But they're our own. And that's the other thing that my grand, I used to ask my grandmother and my grandfather this. Uh, well, they belong to us. And no matter how raggedy they are, they're ours. They belong, and they had some sense of purpose and participation in that. And I don't know if that is true of today. Um, the institution has to be able to respond uh, to today's world, to, to young people in Black Lives Matter, uh, to, uh, uh, to deal with uh, how we face this condition. That's the one strength black folk had, is some kind of crazy spirituality to keep, keep it going. You know, I mean, I mean, we lost a lot of people, but somehow we kept going. And I, you know, I think that's our strength. We're gonna open up um, to questions from the audience, but I just have one more question to you about your experience in writing this book. You said that in African American studies, nobody talks about religion. Why do you think that is? Um, in the late 60s, you know, uh, when Dr. King got killed, people thought r religion was talked about enough. Uh, and black studies became, in my opinion, uh, um, n did not critically evaluate religion, but uh, sort of shunned to the side. So in the numerous books that I read, for, with, few, so with some exceptions, um, People don't talk about, well, that person was a Baptist, and that meant something to them. What does that mean to them? That person was a Methodist. That had to mean something to them. Uh, you don't just make those. Or what does it mean now that people use these uh, uh, non-denominational? That has to have some kind of uh, uh, a meaning to, to, to people. Or uh, if I'm a Baha'i, what is that? What is the, the kind of liberating point of, of, of that? In, and black studies seems to shun, shun talking about, it. there are people who write about African American religion, but they are off in the corner of religious studies, but they really also ought to be speaking to African uh, American studies and black studies. Well, now we want to talk to you. Yes. Were you waving or was your hand up? No, I was. Please, we'll take your question. Well, first, thank you for the forum, because I didn't know what to expect. Uh, I'm a native Georgian. I'm a great baby. Me too. Yeah. Well, right here. Ha, ha, ha. 
I'll, I'll beg to differ just a little bit with you. Okay. Uh, we had multiple things we didn't talk about. Uh, and again, you know, um, uh, people both had belief and non-belief in black kidneys. Not everybody believed, uh, and so we should respect that because uh, there are lots of people who quietly didn't go to church or participate in the movement, or there were the critics of the movement that said it was too churchy. Uh, so I, I, think, I think that we have all of those in our community, and, um, uh, and even those people who are non-theistic, I'll put it that way, uh, they, uh, they, they still have something that uh, girds them to keep, keep, up, keep marching, to keep doing this right. Coming out, people have always been uh, uh, lesbians and gay folks in black churches. Just anybody studies the gospel circuit of music knows that. Uh, it's always been, 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 been that case. Uh, it's better not to, uh, to make people go secret about that today. Uh, to, in my, this is my opinion, uh, because it's always been there. Uh, and, and people uh, grow up loving who they love, and we don't, uh, and we're not there to cast a, a aspersion on. But it's, black community has always been more complex uh, than. That's why I, I appreciate my sister's novels because she delves into the complexity of our lives, and 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 I think that's always been the case, even historically. We just deny it. I have a question for you. I've been meaning to ask you this. I might as well ask you now. I've been thinking about the idea that black culture is a can be if there's a, if there's a such thing as a secular Christianity because I feel like the culture is so Christian like I don't think that you can understand black speech without like black speech is kind of churchy even if you're not churchy because um, like my dad doesn't go to church it's like one of his things he hasn't he became a non-believer when he was a little boy when he was a little boy he was on his way to church with his mama because his daddy was a preacher and they saw some white people walking this way and they were walking that way and he said he asked his mama where are those white people going all dressed up on a Sunday and his mama said boy they're going to church and he said that you know he grew up doing Jim Crow and such oppressive racism that he felt that if they were going to church and he and his family were going to church than something he had been told wasn't true. But he has an incredibly churchy personality because his daddy was a preacher. So I was like, he's culturally a Christian. Like his values are the same values of the, of the church at its best, but he doesn't consider himself a member of the church. But I was saying about like language, like the word blessed. Like black people say blessed all the time. And there is no secular word that gives you the same feeling of saying, I'm blessed. I am lucky doesn't mean the same as I am blessed. I am fortunate doesn't mean the same as I am blessed. Only blessed means blessed, but it's a religious word. Yeah. And people use it even if they're not religious because there's no other way to say whatever that thing that makes a difference between being lucky and being blessed. Right. Well, we're the, we're the children of the King James Bible. You know, um, we, uh, in our speech pattern, you know, uh, People, uh, reporters kept saying black, in the 80s, black kids speak Ebonics, and, cause they say acts. Well, that's the King James Bible. He asks me, and it comes down to language. Um, a little boy on my old street said, uh, Dr. Jelks, uh, such and such, he be afflicted. <laughs> I said, well, where'd you learn afflicted? He said, I heard it at church. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he be afflicted. It was perfect uh, West African syntax. He be afflicted. I was like, wow, this is interesting. So I, I kind of chuckle, uh, but we, we, we have incorporated that language that, uh, that, you know, the King James Bible. Uh, I have students having trouble reading Shakespeare, something from Shakespeare, right? But the black students, like, yeah, well, it sounds like the King James Bible I heard at church, you know, I mean, and the, the and, language. And the shared stories, yeah. like, I feel like if you reference the stories of the Bible, even if you, because it's such a part of the culture, 
that people know exactly what you mean in a way that were you to take it away from the story. Like, you know, even if you just say somebody got more problems than Job, yeah. you, you know what they mean, and it's, it resonates differently than to say this person is extraordinarily challenged. It just, it just feels, I think that shared history and this, so even, because I mean, how many black people are more than one or two generations at the most? removed from the church is part of our culture. Right, well, and part of the wrestle with all of these individuals is what to do with this black Protestantism that we, we inherited, this, this King James Bible. But I wanna stretch further, I wanna see further, how do we do it? But you know, Muhammad Ali uh, could sing hymns with the best of them. Uh, we forget that, and all of those hymns that you learn uh, and all those vacation Bible schools that he attended, and you attended, I attended. That's right. Uh, then it's in. You're, you're right. It's 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 a part of our culture and our language. And uh, he has more problems than Job. Is m far more beautiful. <laughs> yeah, it's more colorful. Yeah, but yes, my grandma used to kidnap us and take us to vacation Bible school. She was gonna save us from our daddy. <laughs> 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 yes, sir. In the back. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my question is, in your opinion, what is the clear definition or the difference between Christianity and, like you said, believers? Uh, it, can you say that again? I got the... the, the difference the, between Christianity and believers, in your opinion. Oh, the difference... Well, uh, Christianity and believers. Christianity... Uh, 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 encompasses a, a set of uh, beliefs. Even Christians are different. Different on you know what is under Christianity is from Seven Day Adventists to Jehovah Witness uh, to Latter Day Saints, Mormons. What under Christianity is a wide range of uh, people arguing about what is it, what is the set of tenets that are important um, to uh, to the faith. And the Roman Catholics look at all of us as like, oh, you know, we've been around here the longest. Uh, uh, although my friends in the Orthodox traditions, I mean, Russian, Romanian, uh, all of those, and uh, Coptic Orthodox in North Africa say, no, we have been around the longest. Uh, all of them have different sets of practices and emphasis. So, uh, you know, uh, so we all have beliefs. Uh, but it is the entirety of the faith. So Christians believe that uh, Jesus is the Christ. All Christians would affirm that um, uh, across the board uh, as a central tenet of Christianity. Uh, whereas my friends who are Jewish and Muslims, well, Jesus is a good prophet, but he ain't the Messiah, right? So there are differences even in the the kind of Abrahamic faiths um, uh, among uh, uh, people. So beliefs in every religious group have their own internal discussions you know, about what is central and what is uh, uh, to, tended to, to the faith. There is a difference between religion and having a personal relationship with God. Religion is mostly, when I say personal relationship with God, some people say born again, saved. But anyway, there's a, religion is man reaching up to God, whereas salvation is God reaching down to man to show his mercy, love, and grace. A lot of people are religious. Even those ISIS, they're religious. But we, we want a personal relationship with God. We want salvation. We want to feel that God loves us, has accepted us, and when we die, which we all will, we're going to be, we've been forgiven of our sins, and we're going to be with him. So that's all. I mean, that, I, I just to respond, that, that is uh, the perfect evangelical 
point of view about what Christianity does, the, the kind of idea that it is, it is personal. Uh, other groups might say, it, no, it is about the community. Um, other Christians might uh, argue differently. So that's why there is a pluralness even within one religion or faith, let's put it that way. Um, all would argue that, uh, uh, that there is something important about, something transcendent about our lives. So uh, everybody uh, would argue that, but we do take positions, and sometimes my job, I'm an academic, you, you remember this, that my job is to a actually make you think about what, what your point of view is, and by writing about these people, I, I hope people think about their point of view and that there are multiple point of views, uh, uh, even within our own community. And there's a freedom to having those multiple point of view. We may never come to a, a consensus or an agreement. I may never agree with you, but I will always respect you. And in the end, um, it's God, not, not us. Yes, did you find that the four people that you uh, wrote about used their faith for social change in the community, or was it more a faith for my own personal struggle? Um, so, you know, one of the things that I was struck by is that the two women, and I use this word, uh, uh, looked at faith very much as care of the self. The two males in the, this uh, looked at it, faith as care of the self, but power uh, as this structure of way we get power. And so there's a real uh, distinction uh, there. Uh, uh, each one of the, 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 the two women, and that why I chose to do work right on two women is because I thought uh, I, I wanted to understand more uh, uh, Black women are the most religious group in our community. What does that mean? And what are they, what are they, what are they searching for? Um, um, uh, what does it mean uh, for a woman to convert to Catholicism? One of the reasons she says she converts to Catholicism, she wanted to go to Abyssinian Baptist Church, right? But the church was locked up, and she couldn't get in. But St. Lourdes, she could go pray anytime she wanted. Um, those are all kinds of interesting ideas of what, what was important to uh, someone and as, as they get carried on their spiritual journey and mentored on their spiritual journey. Good afternoon. Uh, Good afternoon. I'm curious, uh, you didn't mention anything about Eldridge Cleaver and Chris Lam yes. and how his it's search yeah, and, his, and, he, and he he's was trying on to emerge Christianity. Journey. Yeah, there, there are two sides of Eldridge, uh, and, and and it reflects. And among African Americans, religion is a business. It's one of the few businesses we could own, independent of white people. So you got to build your following. Being a preacher is an entrepreneur. You got to build your following. You ain't got no following. Nobody gonna you know pay no attention to you, right? Uh, so it's kind of entrepreneurial, and that's one side of black church that we don't talk about. You know, you got, somebody got to pay the bills. Sure. <laughs> so Eldridge thinks he can build his own religion for a minute because he's, he's in a desperate situation to try to pay the bills toward, when he comes back in the country, he, has, he doesn't have the cachet that he once had in the 19, late 60s, early 70s. So what does he do? Build, try to build a religion called Chrislam. Explain it to us. Uh, both, it's a combination of Islam and Christianity, and it's called Chrislam. What do you wear? Uh, that w well, Eldridge. <laughs> Just wondering. Uh, but that, that's, a, that's a whole different topic, because Eldridge is so, he's so desperate for money, he makes a pants called the cock pants, uh, and that th it shows the male genitalia protruding. You can go online and look at this. I'm not. It, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he yes. Did they come in different colors. Uh, oh, yeah, oh, it was it was jumpsuit, baby. It was jumpsuit. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and you can go online and look at it. Uh, yeah, I showed this to my uh, students in uh, um, 
in my black masculinity class, and they all went. <gasps> I can't believe you didn't have a slide. No, I, I wasn't going to put a slide up. Well, it is Sunday. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. So uh, it, it, in the book, do you engage with individuals who help stimulate and guide them? For, for instance, you mentioned Muhammad Ali to Elijah, but it was really Malcolm, Malcolm for who really wanted to introduce Muhammad to the Nation of Islam as a way of a redemptive way to build their relationship. Well, and then they broke off. It's a little more complex than that. Uh, Elijah, Muhammad, and Malcolm were com com competing for the young convert. Yeah. Uh, because both of them see, you know, this kid is, whoever gets him gets the superstar and also gets the following. And uh, Ali decides to go with the old guy, uh, Elijah Muhammad. And, not, and, and in some sense, that's a death sentence for Malcolm uh, that Ali did not go with him. Uh, so it's a complex relationship once again. Thank you. Um, quick question. So I know you pretty well. So I'm um, just. Yeah, I, I know you <laughs> since you were an infant. Yeah, yeah. yeah a long time. But um, I want to bring up the question if you had the chance to add a fifth character or, you know, person to your book, who would you choose and why? That's a great question. Toni Morrison. Hmm. Because her, you know, Chloe Wolford was a Catholic convert, and she chose the name St. Anthony. Her friend said, uh, that's a bit long. Why don't we go with Tony? Uh, part of that Catholic journey is in her, uh, and I always, when I'm reading Toni Morrison, I'm always thinking uh, as much a theologian as she is the novelist, because she's, she's exploring depravity, human depravity, the depths where we will go. I always thought about Morrison, but she was alive, and, and uh, uh, I thought, well, I, but, but I, I was always wondering, because um, she doesn't talk about her Catholic conversion much. I don't, I don't know what that means to her later on in her life, but I thought about it a great deal. All right, once again, um, I'm going to deviate a little bit from, you know, the four people, but I have a good friend of mine, and we've had this conversation quite a few times. Um, he was raised, um, his father was a, uh, was a preacher in Chicago, and, he, you know, they spent five days a week in church every day. So he knows the Bible inside out, you know, from going to church seven, almost seven days a week from what he told me. But now, you know, when I have conversation with him, um, he no longer believes in God, at least not from the Christian God that we, you know, um, the, you know, Christian people believe in. He don't believe in Jesus Christ, even though his father's still a preacher now. And he believes that a black man uh, has all the elements in the earth inside of him, and based on that, that black people are their own God, that you don't have to look and search for any other God anywhere else. Not Muhammad, not Jesus Christ, not Buddha, not nobody else. So I was just going to ask you this controversial belief, and I have talked to some of his friends that have the same kind of belief system, and I was just going to hear, what do you think about that? Well, um, having lived on the African continent for about a year, um, um, there were always, uh, within different people group, language groups, there were always different gods. Um, we brought that o on the ship with us. Um, the complexity of, of, of different beliefs. Uh, you know, I used to visit one of the uh, priests and or, and or the priestess, depending on their time, and their god likes snobs. 
That's what libations was for. I, I was like, how did the God know he, he's to bring snops? <laughs> you know, why not, why not some, you know, Boone's Farm, you know? But this God likes snops, so gods have, you know, I mean, we had a, compl a complex cosmology even before we arrived in, in North America. Um, uh, anybody goes to Brazil will uh, understand that or Haiti where the the revolution uh, by Toussaint Leverture was really formed by people uh, um, uh, gathering around Boudoun and Boudoun means God and in, 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 uh, from Benin um, so their God so and there's always even in, even in the the, the Hebrew scriptures, they, you know, there's always talk about multiple um, uh, divisions about this, this particular, who is this God? That's why in Hebrew, you're not supposed to say the name of God at all. Uh, it's Yahweh, which is no name, right? I think that may be it. Thank you so much for coming, everybody. Thank, thank you. Thank you.